so much for the invitation to come join you all today. Uh, I was supposed to come and visit in November of this year, but then I went to the airport and they decided to not fly Cape Scare over here on that day because it was too cold. So, however, I did get on the plane this morning and come over here and it wasn't too scared. So, it's great to be here. I, it, being a part of this leadership institute is so incredible. It's, there's so many great conversations and things that are happening and I think all of this professional development just does so many great things for our community and it's just great to be a part of that environment. So I'll give you a little bit of my background before I get into kind of the key note, key areas of what I'm going to speak about today, which is all about leadership, all about communication, and all about harnessing your power in your leadership role, because that's what helps us be a better community. So I'm a farm girl. I was raised in central Idaho uh, in this tiny town called Grangeville, about 3,000 people. I grew up in a farm, uh, raised by very supportive parents. Uh, with all of the expectation that I would help on the responsibilities of the farm. I'm sure this can resonate with many people that are in this community. Lots of responsibilities, taking care of cattle, driving the hay truck, um, doing all those things that make your summer really disappear because you have to do all the responsibilities on the farm. But I was raised on the farm. My family still lives there today. They still own the ranch. Uh, my parents always encouraged me to be in activities do things outside of the ranch because they wanted me to not be tied to the ranch when I grew up. I always had the option to come back and work there and whatnot, but they wanted me to explore opportunities. So they put me into activities and it, that was kind of the, that was just what we did. My brother and I were involved in these different activities in school and very much involved in the community. My parents, both entrepreneurs, uh, dad is a farmer. He was also county commissioner for a while, uh, big in the agricultural community. My mom's a real estate agent, both very successful entrepreneurs in their own lives and understood the importance of community and understood the importance of being involved in that community. And that had a dramatic influence on me. Lots of community, communication, relationships, perseverance, doing things that you don't wanna do, but for the greater good. So that was what I, what I grew up with. Uh, I grew up with, yeah, with a younger brother too. We were taught all these lessons by my parents. So my junior year of high school, getting ready to graduate, it was a whirlwind. As a 4.0 student, I had recently just returned from my, uh, my winning year at the state debate tournament. I was state debate champion in Idaho. You can look it up. No big deal. No big deal. Debate's kind of been a part of my life ever since that. But after, after the end of my junior year, I was preparing to, gra to graduate college and go to, go, and go to college the following year, doing all these things. And I was applying for college, getting ready for the summer of harvest and haying, and my life literally stopped. I was driving into town uh, to go, I lived 10 miles outside of town. I was driving into town to go to an awards ceremony <coughs> night before graduation. As a junior, I was going to present some awards and my little Ford Ranger was hit broadside by a large farm truck. And I was immediately thrown into a coma. My life stopped. So I spent the first half of the summer in the hospital and it was something that <coughs> that stopped me in my tracks and it was something that created some distinct anxiety in my family of course because they didn't know what was going to happen they didn't know if i would wake up they didn't know all the plans that we had for me to go to college and to do all these things was stopped i'm sure that these this story resonates with some of you that happens in these small communities where we're so close and then something dramatic like that happens and it resonates through the entire community. So for 16 days, I was unconscious. I was in a coma, and they didn't know how I would react when I came out of the coma. And I, it was day, about day 10, I started to come in and out of, I wasn't in and out of consciousness, but I was starting to respond to the people around me. The nurse would ask me to squeeze her finger, and I, I would do that, and my eyes were still closed. 
Sometimes my eyes were open, but I still didn't know what was in the room. And it was day 16. Uh, my mom and my parents were by, my mom and dad were by my side. My brother was in the room too. Room full of flowers. And my brother, two years younger than me, was sitting on the other side of the room. My mom had this stress ball. You know that one that you squeeze to relieve stress? He was thrown against the wall and it was bouncing all over the room. And I literally opened my eyes and said, Sean, you're really starting to piss me off. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, and I, I didn't say it that loud, I'd had tubes in my throat, so it was, it was, there was a little bit of laughter and tears that I'd spoken, the first words that I had spoken in two and a half weeks, and uh, it was all about my brother. So uh, you can imagine what kind of relationship we had, annoying younger brother. But what it did have was a little glimmer of hope that I was going to, showed a little bit of my personality that I was going to come out of this and recover. But it was a long road ahead of me. I stayed in an intensive rehab center for the next four weeks to regain my strength and to return to the function on my own. Uh, little things that we don't think of, taking a walk across the room feeding myself, or even swallowing, I had to relearn all of those activities. Those are things that we take for granted. Those are things that we do every day, but I had to relearn how to do all that. Imagine having to reset your life at 17 and to not remember to how to swallow or to not remember how to put one foot in front of the other and walk down, walk down the aisle of the hospital. So there, it's, it was a really challenging time. One that I didn't really realize when I was in the throes of it because I just wanted to be who I was before. I wanted to do all the things that I was doing. I, in my mind, I was still going to college, or I was still applying to go to college in the next couple of months. But there was a, lot, a long way to go before I got there. So after the four weeks in the hospital, they released me to home, and I had the opportunity to, with the prescription for physical rehabilitation and to prepare for my senior year of college. In the next four weeks, it was some recovery and also preparing to go to college, but that was, that was the one challenging question that my parents definitely had to answer, is do we put our child in college or do, or do we put our child back in school and doing all the things that she was doing before, or do we give her a less schedule and help her recover and along the way, but my dad, bless his heart, was always very perseverant about, she's going to college in a year. She's going to get back to it. I went back into all the things that I did before. Uh, I, I did the debate team. I was elected class president, which I don't actually remember because of the amnesia from the accident. But uh, I, I was class president. I did all of those things before. And you know, my dad, my dad was right. I was able to get back into everything. I was not 100% at all. I was still learning how to talk and walk again and learning how to put things together. But really, in hindsight, one of the things that really helped me was returning to the strange world of speech and debate. Debate and speech, it was something that was something that I really enjoyed and something that was intuitive to me. I enjoyed being in that community. I enjoyed having those discussions. I liked, to, you know, for a debate, you sit and listen to another speech and then you have to write your speech and then stand up and give your seven to 10 minute speech after that. It's a very active, dynamic activity. And it was something I felt very comfortable doing. And it was something that was intuitive to me. And when I returned to that activity, this is not scientific at all, so this is not a prescription, but I really do feel that returning to that activity is what helped me recover in the long run. Because I continued debate <laughs> that year, I took third place at state debate that year, I graduated salutatorian, and I planned to go to college. So it was, a, it was crazy that I had all these things happen. I just returned to my routine, and then it comes May when I was ready to graduate, and I did what was impossible, we all thought would be impossible a year earlier. Very fortunately, I was able to return to school, go back to all the things, and go to college. So in a blur, that was all over, and I went to Carroll College 
for my undergraduate degree as a communication major, although I studied communication, and as a member of their nationally competitive debate team. And in a fast five years, my time at Carroll College debate was done. I was graduating, I was ready to go to college, or ready to go to college, I was ready to take the next step after college. We had just become national champions for the debate team. I really wanted to give back to it because at that point I realized this opportunity that I had to give back to the activity that had given back so much to me. I was, you, I was so comfortable in my intuition and in, my, in these skills that I developed and these skills that really transformed my own life that I wanted to give back to that. So then I pursued the degree to be able to, so I could be a professor, so I could take other amazing people across the world to debate, like Katie sitting here filming me. And it's really fun to be able to give back to the community. I'm still teaching today. It was great to be able to give back to that. And I got so comfortable in that. I got my master's degree and I went on and I, I've been teaching at Rocky Mountain College here for 17 years now and I'm still teaching today, still giving back to that. But a couple of years ago, I was, I really loved teaching and I loved taking people around the world and I loved being in front of a classroom, I loved speaking, but I felt there was something missing. I felt that there was, and this feeling may resonate with many of you in the room, but you feel that maybe there's something that you're not being fulfilled in a way that you used to be. We've been in our jobs for a while, where things are kind of routine, we get pretty comfortable, but then we kind of feel like we want something more. And that's how I felt a couple of years ago when I decided to take the leap and jump into the field of entrepreneurship as a side hustle. And now, three years later, I'm a four-time international best-selling author, I'm CEO of three companies, and senior vice president of a global consulting council and I have the opportunity to engage with people all over the world. So it's the one, one thing I learned from that, a few lessons from that trip, and I could talk a lot more about my entrepreneur experience too, but really what my entrepreneur experience is all around is that I create a, a business out of my intuition, out of my genius. I understood what my genius was and where my skills and strengths were. Everybody that went through the Leadership Academy You've all been through this too. You understand who you are as a leader and what your skills are and what power you have. And when you have that true understanding of what I call your intuition and I call your genius, you can create a business out of that. And you can do anything you want with that. When we have that true understanding of ourselves and we have that, that whole idea of ourselves. Wrote a story about it and now I'm able to step into that entrepreneur space. But there's a few lessons that I learned from this experience of, of taking the side hustle, taking the step out of my comfort zone. And the first one is that sometimes we get trapped in our silos of success. And we, and, and it, we can be in an industry, I think of academia, I think of teaching, and you teach and then you pick up responsibilities and become committee members and you climb the ladder to get more money and you have more responsibility and then you're doing all these things. But it's something that's not necessarily fulfilling to who you are and where your true genius is because you're doing things that the industry tells you you're supposed to do, which might not be what is true at the core of your genius and the true core of how you operate as a leader. And, and so that silo of success, and I felt that too in my own job. I've been teaching for a long time, and I loved it. And I, I still love it. I teach to this day. I still teach half time. But I love being in front of the classroom, but I was not finding the fulfillment in all the other areas of my life. And that's when I decided to take a step outside of that silo and start to understand my own power and how my genius fits into other industries and other businesses. Not an easy task, however, <laughs> and those in the leadership class and those of you in leadership just in your own space know that when you step into another position or when you step, when you get promoted in your, at your, in your industry, in your business, or when you start another job, you take your skills with you, but you got to adapt those skills to be able to fit into this new role. 
And sometimes that's stepping, it feels like stepping back. And so it takes some courage, it takes some comfort in your own self to be able to step into that role. And I, that's one lesson that I think that we can all think about when it comes to leadership and understanding that I've got to push myself and I've got to be uncomfortable sometimes to be able to grow as a leader and to be able to be fulfilled with who I am and the kind of influence that I'm having. And sometimes growth and sometimes that leadership growth comes in those uncomfortable spaces because we get trapped in that silo of success. And when we step outside of that, it's a challenge. I'll tell you one, one story about that. When I started my entrepreneur journey, I started consulting with other groups. I, I, in the introduction, I worked in a lot of new manager training, a lot of manager training in business. We all are operating businesses. We all know it's around communication. That we have policies and procedures, but we don't implement them within our own businesses unless we have a strong communication network, unless we have those ideas communicated within our business. And when I stepped into this new manager training series, or I was in groups like Biz to Biz and the Chamber of Commerce, and I did all, I did all these things and, and tried to understand how my business would form and how it would fit into, fit into the goals of what the businesses were, I couldn't give a 50 minute lecture to a group of business professionals for just information's sake. I had to start putting that information in a context of what makes a difference for them. I can't just talk about emotional intelligence for information's sake. I have to tell you, the audience, what emotional intelligence is and why concentrating on emotional intelligence can really transform your workforce. So there's a lot of different ways to think about that. It went from informing my audience to really engaging my audience and understanding the needs of business professionals around me and how those, that communication information can transform your working environment or transform your own business. There's a lot of things that I learned in that, but it took a lot of failure for me, not failure, but it took a lot of challenges and it, it, to transition the way that my teaching industry had taught me how to communicate. I bet you all have experienced that too, especially when you move from being, uh, I, I use this example all the time, when you move from being a worker to a manager, that changes your communication style. You are managing people and you're supervising people, which is a different role and responsibility that you have than the worker that's actually that's doing the work. There's two very different communication styles and often, that transition and any transition that we make, whether it's in our industry or between industries, understanding the communication habits and understanding our audience is really key. So I found that everything I was talking about fit into industry. I just had to reconfigure the way that I was presenting the information so it meant something to you. So that's one thing I learned is that, that the industry, that the industry and the expectations shape us, but then you have the intuition and the power to put your skills into that context. So trust your intuition. If your intuition tells you to act a certain way, yes, think about it, but, but think about how that can make a difference in your business, in your role, and even possibly in your life about how that can all transpire. So the comfort zone can be limiting and I think it's important as leaders in our community to think about how we can step outside of that comfort zone and to grow ourselves and to grow our community. So I think a lot of that comes down to trusting your intuition, trusting who you are and then adapting your skills to who to that new role. Third lesson I've learned outside of the intuition and adapting to your audience, you've got to trust yourself, that's key, but then we also have to trust others. And being in a small community, again, Sydney is very much like the town I grew up in in Grangeville. Lots of connections, lots of families that have been here for generations, and but also shaped by new industry, newer industries. The, oil industry, the hospital, all of these new things that 
that we are adapting in these small communities and we're very tight knit network. And sometimes as small business owners and people, many of you are in small businesses, we work in our silos and yes, we're worried about our business and we're worried about our profit and we're worried about whether we can pay our employees next month. Yes, we have those challenges, but there's so much opportunity in engaging the communities around us. Yes, we are in small businesses. Yes, we're in a small community, but that doesn't mean that we're not connected to other people. That if I have a shop on Main Street, then it's directly affected by the shop that's next to me. There's no reason we can't be communicating and talking about how we can partner on things and bring more people in and host events. There's lots of different ways we can do that. And to think about this engagement, because there's, there are, trust, it comes first with trusting yourself, but then trusting others that you're around. Capitalism is competitive. We all need to grow our businesses. We all need to be in that space where we're creating these new opportunities and also having these businesses, but we are so much more fulfilled if we can trust those around us. In my own business, I, I work with a lot of solo entrepreneurs and I work with a lot of corporations. I do leadership and culture training in some corporations and bigger businesses, but then I help solo entrepreneurs develop businesses out of their ideas. So if you have a training program and you're a physical fitness coach, you own a gym and you want to develop a training program, I help you do that and put it online and then we figure out how to engage your digital community and how to build all of those things. When I work with solo entrepreneurs and small businesses, one of the biggest challenges is that CEOs and founders of a company feel like they have to do it all on their own. And in the beginning you do, because you don't have money to pay people to do your marketing and to do your accounting and all of that. In the beginning you do, but then when we start to trust ourselves and we start to trust our genius and our intuition and spend, spend time in that space, then we realize how important it is to delegate those other responsibilities to people that have genius in that area. Whether it's management or marketing or whether you have your genius in accounting, there's, there is a, <coughs> there's a magic in that delegation because then we can stay in our genius. And I think that engagement and partnerships as members of the community and as leaders in the community, it's important to think about how that interacts. So I'll give you an example of a partnership that I'm a part of. Uh, when I'm a part of this global business council. I have 10, there's 10 of us on the council and we all have different experiences. We all have different businesses. We all operate our own independent businesses, but we combine all of our efforts together in one council to be able to create a, this incredible think tank around how to help small businesses grow. And it's amazing to be, you know, we just had this conversation in the leadership team about communication and engagement and argument and having 10 people that are business professionals with own CEOs in their own company come together and try to solve problems for small businesses. There's nothing more powerful than that because there's so many different ideas that build upon each other. However, it's important to be an active participant in that and to understand that yes, there will be some conflict. And yes, there are some times where I'm not going to get my own way. And we just have to trust in ourselves and trust that we <coughs> Excuse me. That our contribution is elevated to that. Um, just to <coughs> excuse me, gotta take all my notes. <clears throat> to give you an example, I just got back from Arizona two weekends ago, and I had the opportunity to engage with uh, Lee Steinberg. You know Lee Steinberg. And in, anybody know the movie Jerry Maguire? <coughs> Most everybody knows that movie. Do we know Patrick Mahomes? <coughs> yeah, Lee Steinberg is Patrick. Mahomes. So how did that happen? I don't know how that happened, but we had a <coughs> we had a football camp with Lee Steinberg Sports Academy, and now we're on the board. And it just goes to show: the more you trust yourself, then you get into a space when you're with other people that are all elevating to the same place. And when we trust ourselves, we trust others because we know we don't have to do it alone. So many important things. <coughs> to remember in our leadership space and just to remember 
that I encourage you to trust your intuition, to trust your skills, and to use those skills to lift up those around you. Work in your genius. Work in the space that you know the best. That's really where the magic is because not only will you fulfill the needs of your business, but you're gonna be much more fulfilled as an individual. And I don't have all the answers, but I do know that you can have success, but then there's that fulfillment, which is the other side of that. And when you have those two things together, then that's so much more fulfilling than working for just the success piece. So there's just a way that you can do that, and it all lies in your intuition. When you trust yourself, and you step into your power of your genius, it allows you to step into a space where you can trust others and trust their genius, to know that you don't have to do everything and you can operate in your genius space to be able to do that as an entrepreneur, as a leader in the community, and it will make everyone around you just elevate their performance to, to, better, to be better. So have the confidence to step into your genius, to step into your leadership role, and to make your community.